This is one of the most important people in my mind at MIT. <laughs> Thanks, John. Desiree, uh, maybe explain your title, what's your role, when did you get tenure, what do you, what do you think about Oh, all those things. Um, I, so <laughs> I'm a, a professor, associate professor of civil and environmental engineering here at MIT. Before that, I was a student here uh, at MIT in the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, I am also the director of the MIT Climate and Sustainability Consortium, which is an organization of some of the largest companies um, here in the States and around the world that are dedicated to kind of changing, um, changing the, our system, our economic systems, uh, in a positive direction uh, for climate solutions yep. quickly. So you grew up in Maine. You, yes, dad, sir. Dad sold beer. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. That, yeah. Entrepreneur in the beer I, space. I was delivering beer as a 12-year-old. Yeah, yes. 12 year old. And and you went. You were an engineer at Union College, so you didn't go undergrad here. And you yes, came here yeah. for your your graduate That's stuff, right. and and you haven't left. Um, you were a leader of innovation at MIT. Tell us what brought you to MIT, and what most inspires you about the way innovation is done at MIT. Yeah, that's a great question. I, the, growing up in Maine, my family's home was situated on a Superfund site, actually, and um, I didn't know that. Uh, but when I was eight, I was sitting you know, in the back of my car driving home with my mom and said, you know, mom, there's a lot of sick people in the neighborhood. Do you think it could have something to do with something that is shared, common, you know, that something toxic in the air or the Civil water? Civil action movie. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I saw that many years later, and it turns out that... Um, you know, I discovered later in life that that was correct. There was this uh, super fun site. It was owned by a family friend. They were following EPA protocols at the time for the disposal of toxic chemicals. Um, their own children were later diagnosed with cancer and are now since passed. Um, my aunt was one of the people who was diagnosed with cancer and passed while I was in graduate school here at MIT. I was blessed to be able to go over to MGH and take care of her during that time. Um, but it really struck me that you know access to clean air and drinking water is a fundamental human right. It's tied to our freedom and our ability to thrive um, as a species, and I wanted to protect that. And innovation and industry shouldn't um, work in the opposite direction. And so I, I understood, you know, really early on that um, business is necessary, and people who are running businesses don't intend to poison themselves or their neighbors. And so I had to be where more uh, innovation. Um, is springing up than uh, I think almost anywhere else on the planet. Here at MIT, I wanted to be training that next generation of innovators to incorporate environmental objectives along with economic ones um, in, in their invention process. Great, so I got three more questions. Next one, mm -hmm. be short, and then two others. <laughs> go, go a little deeper, because it's more about you. Um, MIT's made a commitment under Sally Kornbluth to expand into sustainability. You know, Raphael Reif, the prior president, said, hey, we're gonna do this climate thing. You know, people wondered, was she going to uh, continue it? She's doubled down on it, made it core to her leadership. Tell our audience how you think this program came together and what you think we can look to MIT to accomplish on sustainability. I think people have referred to Stanford, you know, with a billion-dollar center kind of top-down, and they say, oh, MIT is like a wild garden. And, you know, wild garden has pluses and, and minuses. <clears throat> Real quick, because I want to spend more time on you uh, on that. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest pleasures that I have as an MIT professor is access to the young trainees, but also access to some of the world's biggest industries. And that means that we're really well poised to have impact and change the system, which is absolutely what is needed to make this change. The Climate Project, which is what John's referencing, was launched earlier this fall under Sally's leadership with the hard work of, of many people across campus. And one of the things that I really love about our distributed nature is that the climate and environmental problems that we're facing today are distributed. They are systems level problems. There is no silver bullet. We need an all hands on deck approach if we're going to actually make any of the changes that we need to see. Great. Tell our audience a bit about your work at MIT and where you choose to focus. How do you see your role here at MIT? Two years ago, you gave a talk at Planet uh, Action. You said to me, John, I shouldn't give a talk. I'm very, 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 very <laughs> pregnant and I might have to take some deep breaths and people don't want to see you know, a very, very, very pregnant lady. And I said, no, no, <laughs> not only do they need to see you and see real people are dealing with this, but you represent the next generation of Michael Jordans. And 
I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. Can you let people know what, what you're doing? Thank you, yeah, so the, the focus of my group is really on materials and chemical innovation and making sure that we do that better, but also using that materials and chemical innovation to solve really critical climate challenges. And so uh, part of what we do is predict what chemicals are gonna do when they get out into the environment so that we can inform people who are making those chemicals, how to do it better, and to make them more environmentally compliant and, and compatible. Um, the, the, the innovation side, there are two companies that have emerged from my laboratory. One's called Nth Cycle, so not Recycle, but like nerd jokes to the Nth. <laughs> and um, Nth Cycle just opened the first uh, domestic nickel and cobalt production facility this year in Ohio. So we can take those batteries in all of your electric vehicles, pull the material out, and give it back to you. The technology works for semiconducting manufacturing, as well as um, mining uh, tailings reclamation. So it's a really exciting way to improve the sustainability of materials and material processes um, that in decouples it from fossil energy emissions, I should say. It's a 92% reduction in the carbon footprint of materials extraction. So that's a really exciting um, uh, technology, and I'm incredibly proud of the students that are, have led that uh, company going forward. One of them was just named Time Magazine's Top 100 Climate Leaders. That's Dr. Megan O'Connor. Um, yeah, so it's my second PhD student. The, um, the second company that we started, which was the one I was fortunate to talk about here at, at TEDx a couple years ago, is Moxie. Air. And Mox Air uh, relies on an earth abundant um, transition metal, so low cost catalyst that can take methane at low level. Um, emission sources and destroy it. And uh, that's critically important because methane is such a potent greenhouse gas, but it's also a short-lived atmospheric pollutant. So if we can drop the levels of methane in the atmosphere, uh, we can move towards restoring our planet, first of all, but we could also potentially change the rate of climate change before that baby graduates high school. And, um, and that means we avoid climate tipping points, and so we're really excited to be scaling that technology. We'll field demonstrate it within the next 18 months here in the U.S. Great. Last question, then I have a closing comment I want to make. Um, you've helped so many students, you just referred to your Time 100, scale up their sustainability ventures, uh, including several of our speakers uh, this year and last year and, and in the years to come, I'm sure. What do you think our audience needs to know about the steps um, and resources required for successful scale up? Can you tell us a story about one of the uh, sustainability startups uh, you have you have supported and and this is important because I think a generation ago a faculty in your position might have waited a little bit to start and 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 waited to when they reached a certain point but you're just going. You have four kids. You have you know, <laughs> yeah. two startups, and you're not waiting for nobody. Yeah, no, that's a, thanks for noticing that. It's not advisable generally to start companies and have four kids when you're pre-tenure. Um, but it needed to be done. The the, the nation needed it. We scaled and cycle uh, in, within seven years. That was a really aggressive um, timeline. Uh, and we need to do the same thing for for Mox Air because we need these emissions reductions uh, now. And so, what are the the so-called you know everyone's heard of the Valley of Death when you're translating a tech technology from the lab out into the marketplace, um, there are not many people who are willing to take that risk on the early seed investment, and there are not many people who are sufficiently patient to see a return on that investment. So it's quite difficult to convince folks that A, it can work, and B, that they'll see their money come back to them eventually. We've uh, been spoiled by um, the dot-com boom, and, and these aren't dating apps. You know, what climate needs is Angry tough bird. technology. It's not Angry Birds, right? And it, it's not Uber, and, and no offense to Uber, um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's something that will will take time before you, before you see a profit. And so we need patient venture. Um, it often needs to be big venture. So uh, carbon emissions reductions, for example, are projected in the IPC reports at, at 13 gigatons by 2050. Now that's bigger than coal and oil and natural gas combined. They had 200 years to do it. We've got to do it in 20 years. So that is an enormous scale. We're talking about modulating the atmospheric content of the planet. It is going to take a lot of money. <laughs> and it's not a small investment. So we need big and patient checks. And I promise you, you will see the return. Um, we're working very hard to make that economic, but big and patient checks and any kind of accelerator eco ecosystems that can exist. The United States Department of Energy um, has some great accelerator programs that were really key to our success early on. And the more accelerator programs there can be to get people through that risky time, the better off we're all going to be. Great. Thanks, John. Um, so just in closing, I want to make an observation. So we do this quarterly science dinner. Uh, Juan Enriquez helps with that and others here. 
and we bring Nobel laureates, the president of MIT, president of other universities, the governor, and you have held court and been the keynote, and, and, and people are amazed. I want folks like you at MIT to see Planet Action as a platform, but I want to find people like you, and they're rare, at other universities. There are 140 R1 universities, and they're not all going to get the resources and have the access. And I want them to say, hey, get on this platform, hang out with Desiree, learn from Desiree, collaborate with Desiree. Um, Desiree <laughs> is world class and, and really proud to have you. Who would like to uh, do a start a, a startup with a Desiree? <laughs> who, who would want her on uh, their advisory board? Okay. Who would want to hang out with her kids? Yeah. Four of them? Uh, who would want to uh, deliver beer with her? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Desiree Planta. <laughs> Thanks.